I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast Supplement. All right, Lee. This one is my personal choice. If, if, if you threatened me with death and you said you have exactly three seconds to pick one book to give to someone on China, this would be my pick. Rob, how did you know I was thinking about threatening well, you with I, death? The, the gun on the table was a <laughs> kind of a lead-in, but, you know, the crossbow on the wall helped, that kind of thing. Die, Rob, die, written in red paint. All of those, all of those pointed my keen red researcher's realm. eye, that's it, to this, this conclusion. Uh, we are talking today about a little primer of Tufu, T-U-F-U, which is Dufu, obviously, yeah. by the great David Hawkes. H-A-W-K-E-S. Uh, David Hawkes is one of the truly great translators of Chinese literature ever. Yeah, uh, He produced what is still probably the most eloquent translation in English of Hong Lo Meng, Dream mm. of Red Chambers yeah. or S- Story of the Stone. The first 80 chapters, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because the last 40 chapters, which are kind of maybe part kind of, of apocryphal, Hong Lo Meng, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's very much debated in yes, Chinese literary yes. circles. Now, what's great about A Little Primary of Dufu, first of all, uh, Dufu, the Chinese poet, the Tang Dynasty poet, whom we've done a couple of podcasts I on, think so, yeah. Yeah, uh, is arguably the most important poet in the classical Chinese tradition, which then puts him in the ranks of the most imp- one of the most important poets. So we should, we should point out, so there are three poets that yes. you need to know from the Tang Dynasty, right. Du Fu, Li Bai, and Wang Wei. Yes. Du Fu being the sort of orthodox Confucian poet, Li Bai being the sort of most beloved Taoist poet, mm-hmm. and then Wang Wei being the one that everyone hates, but who at the during the Tang Dynasty was, was the rock actually, star. He was the rock star, yeah. Right. The the, the, the the comparison would be between Li Bai and Du Fu, sort of like between Bach and Handel from the Baroque era. I think it's more of Beatles versus Rolling Stones. No, because those two are so no, no, it neck and neck. Is. Well, I agree the Stones win in a landslide, but uh, um, Wait, another sorry, thing, what? you and I are always going to disagree about that question. I've never <laughs> liked the Beatles. Anyway, though it's an interesting comparison the Beatles-Rolling Stones thing because uh, people tend to like Li Bai or Du Fu uh, for very different reasons. They're, they're not like the same kind of poet uh, in the same way the Beatles and Stones are not the same kind of group, right? You right. prefer one style over another. But they're, they're both Li Bai and Du Fu are, they live at the same time. They yes. know each other. Yes. They're writing to each other. There's lots of They're connections. writing about similar events, similar yeah. heartbreaks because of the An Lushan Rebellion. The which An Lushan Rebellion being the, the mid-8th century, so it, occurs in I think seven fifty something. Yeah. Um the the rebellion that is done by a Sogdian military leader to try and overthrow the Tang dynasty because the Tang dynasty is too too much that the emperor is too in hawk to his his uh concubine Yang Gui Fei. So we should we should say An Lushan. So Lushan uh, uh, An Lushan is of course Songdian, which is um, Rob, you may or may not know this, but that's a that's a language that's closely closely related to today's Farsi or Persian. Hmm. And did you know Lushan? We have a, a name actually in English that we use that's uh, a cognate of that. I didn't know that. Do you know what it is? I do not. Roxanne. Oh yeah. So you can actually call An Lushan Roxanne Ann. Cue the police song. <laughs> exactly. Um, but Roxanne. Oh man. See, you that's don't the one, have to put That's one of those on songs you don't want to hear anyone actually attempt to sing because it's just hideous. Um, <laughs> as I demonstrated. Yeah, as you just demonstrated. Thank you so much, Lee. Now, it, 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 so that as that dig- that's not really a digression, but the two poets are writing in a very very tense, difficult period. Uh, Lee Bai tends to be the romantic. Idol, the, the the one who drinks and stares at the moon and writes and about long lost comrades. And he, yeah, uh, supposedly Dufu, he may have mythically died in the Yangtze River, like toasting the moon, his, which which his was reflection amazing. in the moon. Of course, that's which, that's completely apocryphal. apocryphal, but it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but that gives you some idea of the popular reception of Li Bai. Du Fu, by contrast, is boring. He's someone who he's, works he's in the a, civil bureaucracy. A lot of his poems are about wishing he could get back to his job in the civil bureaucracy and be with his family, etc. He himself is not that interesting. What makes Du Fu stupendous is his almost baffling mastery of pretty much every form of Chinese poetry. I disagree. Every major Chinese form of poetry. I disagree. I think he is interesting. He takes 
bureaucratic poetry to its height, and okay. he actually makes it interesting, I would say. So okay. to, to say that he's not interesting is— I His think, life well, is not interesting. His, his poetry his, is very the, interesting. The, the life that he lived is actually quite interesting because he's, he's running around during all these rebellions my, and my things. Point, my point, this is how I always try to couch him with my students, is that, he first of all, he writes an absolutely enormous amount of poetry, yeah. and he also writes about every topic under the sun, everything from fleeing from revolutionary cabals— to just kind of enjoying looking out his window, right? Uh, the reason I brought up Bach earlier is because Bach mastered every sort of musical form at the time to an incredible extent. And it was extremely rigid and very um, confining because you had to work within certain rules, but he made it seem like there were no rules at all. And that's what it's like reading Dufu in Chinese is you sometimes forget what's actually happening in the poem because it's done so well. Now, we, we digress pretty far from David Hawks. For so. my money, this is what David Hawks nails that a lot of translators don't. He gives you a very, very accessible guide, not only to Dufu, but to the period in which Dufu wrote. So at the same time, you're getting a very brief capsule history of one of the most important eras in Chinese history. And you're, so it's not just about the poems. No. It's also kind of like each a poem has a very quick three, two to three paragraph introduction about the context. Uh, he gives you the actual the original poem and the, with the Chinese characters. He gives you the transliteration. He gives you a word by word translation, which always reads a little bit like gibberish, but it gives you an idea of how the language works. And then at the very end of each section, he gives you his translation of the poem. And this is the part that sold me originally because he writes it in prose poetry form. It's a paragraph. He doesn't mm. try to preserve the line breaks or the rhyming. And I love this because for, for me, in my mind, it approximates the experience of reading Dufu in Chinese because uh, if you just read him out loud, he sounds very sing-songy, da, mm. da, 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 like that. The images as they go through your head do not sound sing-songy, at least when I read them. Mm. And so... I think David Hawks gets across very well the experience of reading Dufu. And you get a huge range. He has some of the quote-unquote boring poems like, gee, it sure is nice to have dinner, that kind of thing, all the way up to, <laughs> you know, finding an exiled prince in the street fleeing for his life, stuff like that. Which we did a podcast on. Which we did a podcast on, yes. Even the ones that are about him eating dinner are interesting because they kind of put this ritual uh, in context, that the kind of ritual setting of Tang Dynasty China in, in into a context that, that's both compelling and aesthetically pleasing. And the book is very short. Yeah. You can get the, through the Dufu's, entire book. Yeah. Dufu, the, the, the David Hawks yeah, book. Yeah, the David Hawks book. Not not all of if you want to read everything Dufu wrote in translation, Stephen, Stephen Owen Owen's has an entire it. website for free yeah. on everything. And or, it's like or, thousands of pages or long. Or you could get the seven volume set which I don't know how much it costs, but I, Rob, you remember this, right? Oh yeah. I have, uh, I got, I got the the seven volume translation for free, and I got David uh, Stephen Owens to sign it. Wow, well done. I forgot yeah. about that. Uh, you do not need to read all seven volumes unless you really like Dufu, or unless um, you're kind of hankering for some some pain. <laughs> yeah, unless you're just yeah, you're a completist or you're an, a masochist, but. If you are looking for a guide to a very important part of Chinese history, and if you're also looking for some way to understand why do people like Dufu so much, this is where you go. Hmm. Uh, as we're wrapping up again, uh, please remember, as always, review us. Let everyone know how awesome we are. Don't leave us a bad review. Only good reviews accepted. <laughs> only five-star reviews. Um, also look us up on Twitter, ChinLitPod for Chinese Literature Podcast. Uh, Instagram, Chinese Lit Pod, and of course, Chinese Literature Podcast at Patreon, our official beer sponsorship network. <laughs> <laughs> Other things as well, of course. No, 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 just beer. Just beer, fair enough. We should put a folder in there, yeah. beer money. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they, can, they can target their gifts. Anyway, uh, and of course, also, Chinese Literature Podcast.com. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.